carbonate platforms, which are these large, shallow zones of carbonate sedimentation, like the Great Bahama Bank here, are probably the most famous and heavily studied carbonate depositional environment. I suppose it doesn't hurt that they're lovely tropical places with nice snorkeling, but they're also important components of a lot of petroleum systems, and so they've attracted a lot of interest over the years for that reason. So a quick recap of, of previous uh, lectures, which considered the carbonate ramp environment and facies you find on carbonate ramps. Remember that the ramp is a shallowly dipping surface with a fairly consistent gradient from the shoreline all the way to the basin. So because of that, the distribution of energy levels on a carbonate ramp is fairly similar to what you find on siliciclastic coastlines, uh, with an energy maximum near the shoreline or the beach environment. In contrast, carbonate platforms are these large, flat-topped shelves instead of a gently dipping ramp. So this bra the, the broad, flat top is typically quite shallow. It's maybe only a few meters to maybe a few tens of meters in depth. Something like 60% 60, 60 of the Great Bahama Bank is less than 5 meters water depth. The platform top can be surrounded by a barrier, which is either like reefs or potentially shoals. And so when there's a barrier present, this is called a rimmed platform. But some platforms actually lack a barrier, and so they're called unrimmed platforms. The margin of the platform, the boundary between the, the shallow carbonate environment and the open ocean, is quite sharp, and, and the, the edge drops off extremely steeply there into the, the deep ocean. So as with any depositional system, as we've seen throughout the quarter, uh, the distribution of energy is a critically important factor on the distribution of lithologies and facies found across the environment. In a rimmed platform, the shelf edge reefs or shoals act as a barrier, and the wave energy gets focused by the abruptly shallowing platform slope or margin, and so this leads to an energy maximum located at the platform edge. The interior of the platform is protected from waves by the shoals or the reefs, so it's a very quiet water lagoon environment where you can accumulate carbonate mud and, and those sorts of finer grain sediments. Even unrimmed platforms actually have an energy maximum at the margins because of this wave focusing as the water abruptly shallows at the edge of the platform. As the water flows across the platform, across this wide and shallow area, it's losing energy by friction, and so this means that the interior of the platform tends to be lower energy than the margin, even when there is um, no barrier present. There might be a secondary energy maximum as waves break at the shoreline, but by that point, a lot of energy is going to be a, have, have been lost through friction as the water makes its way across this broad platform. So this photo shows the, the southwestern margin of the Great Bahama Bank, which is really the, the prototypical modern carbonate platform. The dark blue areas in the lower left um, is the platform slope and, and the open ocean, where the seafloor drops off by literally thousands of feet over just a few kilometers. The edge of the platform is marked by these, lar these large linear shoals that separate the open ocean from the shallow water, light blue area in the upper right, which is the platform interior setting. This map shows the facies distribution in the Bahamas, which is in here it's color coded by rock type as well as by the dominant allochem that you find in those rocks. So the dark green ring that outlines all of the platforms, the Great Bahama Bank, Little Bahama Bank, and the smaller platforms, indicates skeletal grainstones, which is what's the, what is primarily making up the platform margin shoals in the Bahamas. Some of the shoals in, in locations, like at the end of this tongue of the ocean um, part of the platform, may be composed of, of oolitic grainstone, at least in places in the Bahamas. So platform margin shoals have the sorts of sedimentary structures that you'd expect from large subaqueous dunes. The sand-sized particles, like the ooids or the, or the skeletal fragments, get moved in a windward direction, so they get moved downwind or down current. And that could be either towards the lagoon or away from the lagoon, depending on what side of the platform you're on. And this movement of sand-sized particles produces large-scale planar crossbedding. There could be some tidal influence. These um, shoals are sometimes cut by tidal channels, which you can see in the photo on the left. 
and that could potentially lead to herringbone cross beds, for example. And because there's waves, you also will get small scale wave ripples perhaps superimposed on the larger scale dunes. But despite those features, despite the possibility of herringbone cross beds or wave ripples, it's really those large scale planar cross beds that dominate these shoal environments. So here's a, a probable example of shoal facies. Perhaps it's not a carbonate platform, this, this could have been a, a ramp instead, but regardless, uh, the muddier facies at the bottom of the section here probably reflects the lagoon sediments, and then the large planar cross beds above it represent the shoal deposit as it moved over the lagoon. Platform interior facies, because they're lower energy, often contain some carbonate mud, and so therefore they can be pack stones or wax, wacky stones more often. And really they're characterized by peloids, lots and lots of peloids. Peloids are everywhere in these central quiet lagoon sediments. So sometimes in the Bahamas at least, the open lagoonal part of the platform can be still a grainstone. There's no carbonate mud, just a peloidal grainstone. This is typical in the more sort of unprotected areas of the platform. But on the, the lee side or the downwind side of the islands, the islands providing a fairly substantial barrier against wave energy, this is particularly where you can find the muddier sediments, the, the pack stones and, and wacky stones, still peloidal primarily. Remember, the lagoons are pretty much peloids, peloids, peloids all the time. And the Little Bahama Bank in the upper left really shows this classic separation of higher energy grainstone margins surrounding a lower energy, muddier, packstone or wacky stone central lagoon sediments. So one distinctive feature of carbonate sediments in general, but platform sediments in particular, is the formation of these really characteristic cycles that are a meter or a couple meters in thickness. So the, the Triassic, this picture shows the Triassic Latimar platform from northern Italy and the Dolomites, um, and it's really the most famous example of these cycles, but meter scale cyclicity like this, um, shallowing upwards from subtidal through supertidal, is a widespread phenomenon in many, many carbonates. So given the widespread occurrence of these sort of similar looking meter scale cycles, what actually causes them? Why are they so prevalent in, in carbonates? Well, we discussed allocyclic and autocyclic processes before, and so you may not be surprised to hear that there are potentially allocyclic and autocyclic reasons for these meter scale cycles. So, um, in terms of the allocyclic cause, the cycles may just represent rising base level and the resulting creation of accommodation space, and then falling base level, which erodes the top of the cycle and leads to the, a new cycle for a beginning. One, one kind of interesting quirk about carbonates is that the accumulation rates or the sedimentation rates of carbonates in shallow subtidal environments are generally extremely rapid. They're pretty much always faster than any rate of natural sea level rise. So what this means is that carbonate sediment will rapidly fill basically any available accommodation space, and it forms shallowing upward successions even during base level rise. So notice that sort of the accretion window in the, in the diagram of sea level change is the time in which sediment is forming, and so the carbonate sediments are prograding during the time of base level rise, and during base level fall, that's when you form this erosional surface. So another distinctive feature is that these cycles are pretty much often capped by exposure surfaces that formed when base level fell in this model and when the platform top was therefore exposed and weathered in a subaerial environment. So these sort of exposure surfaces, also called karst surfaces, can be recognized by their jagged and their irregular relief. They have little pinnacles that stick up, these kind of jagged pinnacles, like in the, the red arrow shows an example of one. There's also pipes that erode downwards into the underlying unit, um, the yellow arrows pointing at one of these solution pipes, or something it's called. And so this irregular topography is mantled or draped by the overlying unit and infilled by this overlying unit once sea level rises again and allows the formation of new carbonate sediments. So allocyclic processes seem pretty 
um, widespread in these carbonates, but it's also possible that the characteristic meter scale cycles might be autocyclic instead or driven just by the inherent behavior of the carbonate factory. So the basis for this idea stems from the depth dependence of carbonate sediment production, which I mentioned a couple videos ago. So um, sedimentation rates, as shown in the graph on the right, are extremely high in the shallow subtidal area. So the carbonate factory there will tend to aggrade really rapidly to sea level. And because it's aggrading really rapidly, the sediment is building up really, really fast, the shoreline then prograves very rapidly across the lagoon in this model. However, carbonate production, as you can see at the very top of the graph on the, on the right, drops off super quickly in the tidal flat or peritidal area. And so this means that the carbonate factory basically shuts itself down once it's built up to sea level. And so the idea is that the carbonate factory rapidly fills up the accommodation space and then shuts itself down because it's now reached sea level where sedimentation rate is basically zero. And sedimentation doesn't restart until the area has subsided to put the carbonate factory back in the subtidal zone. So you may be wondering, in either scenario, either autocyclic or allocyclic, why doesn't the carbonate sedimentation just keep pace with the sea surface? You know, why doesn't you know, any incremental amount of sea level rise just lead to another incremental amount of carbonate sedimentation? Why don't we just get continuous thick packages of tile flat sediments? Well, this is kind of a mystery. Um, the cycles instead are very strongly asymmetrical. They're, they're basically all progradation, and the retrogradational facies are thin or even absent. So as I said, this is kind of a mystery, and a lot of people invoke something called a lag time, basically arguing that carbonate sedimentation is slow to get started, and so it lags behind base level rise during the early phase or the startup stage. But once the carbonate factory gets established for whatever reason, it forms sediment really rapidly, as I said, and so much more rapidly than base level is rising. It fills up the accommodation space in the, the catch-up stage. And finally, as the carbonates approach the sea surface, sedimentation slows down in this, this keep-up stage. So the mechanisms causing this lag time aren't really known that well. It's perhaps related to wave scouring of this lithified exposure surface during transgression, but regardless, it does seem necessary to have some sort of asymmetrical relationship between water depth and carbonate sedimentation, where the rate of carbonate sedimentation sort of depends on where you are in the base level cycle.